Hey, rock stars, it's Lid Shaw, and thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. My guest is David Thoner, who had so many great things to say, and he's done so much in recording that we decided to split it up into two episodes. So welcome to part one of David Thoner, ACDC, for those about to rock. Sweet. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Hello, rock stars. It's your host, Lid Shaw. I created this show to introduce you to real world recording professionals, to hear their stories and learn from their experiences so that you can take your records to the next level and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is David Thoner a multi-Grammy winning producer, engineer, and mixer with a true rock star list of credits to his discography. In fact, David has made many of the records that I grew up with that helped to define rock music for me. David started his career in 1974 as an assistant engineer at the record plant in New York City, and he learned his craft helping to create Aerosmith Toys in the Attic, Bruce Springsteen, Born to Run, David Bowie, Young Americans, John Lennon, Walls and Bridges, Electric Light Orchestra, Face the Music, and Richie Blackmore, Rainbow Rising. David then moved on to engineering and mixing records in 1976 and has since enjoyed a 30-year run of hit records, including classic records for ACDC, For Those About to Rock, John Mellencamp, Little Pink Houses, John Waite, Missing You, all the hits from the Jay Giles Band, Matchbox 20, and many others. In 2000, David won two Grammys for Record of the Year and Album of the Year for recording and mixing Smooth by Santana featuring Rob Thomas. David has also mixed hit records for Jason Raz, Faith Hill, and Sugarland, and has made records all over the world, including South Africa, Sweden, Australia, Mexico, and Japan, to list a few. I'm extremely lucky and honored to be able to have this interview in person since David lives right here in Nashville, Tennessee. Please welcome David Thoner to Recording Studio Rockstars. David, are you ready to rock? I am ready to rock, Liz. How are you? I'm doing great, man, and I feel like we need to follow this up with it, and yes, we definitely salute you. Oh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's 40 years. 40 years. No, right. So I yes. was reading the 30-year bio. Yeah, you're reading the 30-year bio, which unfortunately was done like 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> know. You know, right, right when websites were brand new. Probably yeah, too. exactly. Exactly. Well, again, I'm super honored to have you here on the podcast. Thank you're you. a great guy. And, and I've, I've listened to you speak before, as I was telling you, and it's been a real pleasure to learn from you. Can you tell our listeners, uh, who I like to refer to as the rock stars, a little bit more about who you are and how you got into all this? Absolutely. I actually started before Record Plant, to just go back a little bit further, I was 10. I think it was 64 when they came. They were on the Ed Sullivan Show. And I just became a huge Beatles fan. And then around 67, I was into Hendrix and The Doors and Jefferson Airplane and The Stones, naturally. Big, big, huge fan of Hendrix, especially. And where were you, East Coast? I was point? in New York. In New York. Uh, I'm a New Yorker. Uh, born and raised in Yonkers, New York. And so I got into Hendrix Records. I would go to the Fillmore in like 67, 68, when I was around 14. I would go with some friends down the Fillmore, which was a great place to see bands. I was on 2nd Avenue below 14th Street and east side of Manhattan. And you could get in for like $5 in orchestra. Right. And that's kind of expensive, five bucks back then. Uh, it was, but it's still, uh, you know, to go see. And But you saw two or three bands sometimes. So, you know, you might see the Allman Brothers and uh, Savoy Brown or, you know, just Rod Stewart and the Small Faces. I mean, just amazing. In fact, I saw Hendrix Band of Gypsies there on New Year's Eve of 1960, uh, or maybe it was 71. Wow. It was the live at the Fillmore Again, hard for me to remember if it was 71 or 72. And I only bring all this up because it's what was the inspiration for me getting into the business. As I said, I was like 14, 15, 16, and I would go down religiously on a weekend and see whoever was playing. It almost didn't matter who was playing. And then there was another venue that opened up close by called the Academy of Music, 
And they equally, uh, or almost the same area, it was like 14th Street and 2nd Avenue. And they had uh, also great bands. And so in that period of time, like 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, I was going to see shows religiously. And that's really what got me wanting to go into recording. How, how this all came about quickly is that I, I happened to be in the principal's office one day in 12th grade. I didn't, don't remember what I was getting in trouble for, but I was <laughs> Probably always, for going to too many rock shows, right? <laughs> getting in trouble for something. And I'm sitting there getting ready to walk in and see the principal about whatever it was. And a gentleman was sitting next to me and he just turned to me and said, what grade are you in? And I said, 12th grade. He said, so, you know, where are you going to go to school next year? And I said, well, I wanted to go to MIT, but I don't don't have the grades for it, unfortunately. I mean, I applied and got turned down. So I ended up going to New York Institute of Technology out in Westbury, Westbury, Long Island. And he said, so what are you going to take up? And I said, well, I'm going to take communications because it was 1972. No one taught recording. So I thought, well, I'll take communications because in the, in the school pamphlet, it says they'll teach you how to use a tape machine and this and that, which I learned after the first semester that a lot of that was total bullshit. I went there. Now it's definitely bullshit. Oh. <laughs> if they tell you you're going to learn a tape machine. I went there for uh, my first semester, realized that what I was learning uh, was not what I wanted to learn. I wanted to make records and I was DJing. I happened to see... In a pamphlet or a newspaper, there was a recording school underneath a Howard Johnson's. That's the era. So I read about this school that these guys started, and their claim to fame was that they had recorded Rock Around the Clock. I believe that's Bill Haley in the comments. Nice, nice. So that was like the only record that they had done. So their career was like, bring gone, you know, right? <laughs> and But they like driving Corvettes and stuff like that. So they, they obviously figured out, well, we got to do something else, you know, if we want to keep this lifestyle up. So they started a school. This is 1972. Wow. Right? And the console at the time, it wasn't anything that anybody would know. It wasn't a Neve or an API or anything like that. You know, it was probably a homemade console of some sort. And I believe the transport for the multitrack was... It was like an MM-1000 or something like that. It was a 16-track, big monster machine. I've got a, one, a buddy here in Donaldson with one of those. Oh, okay. So um, went through this school. There was no hands-on. So like they, the guy would sit down and he would be mixing, but you wouldn't be able to touch the faders. He would do editing. You wouldn't be able to touch the tape. You know, He would put the machine record. You wouldn't be able to touch that. <laughs> you just were an observer. But the good thing about it was that it, it taught you signal path, taught you, you know, what a preamp does. It taught you the properties of different microphones, dynamic and cardioid and ribbon, condensers, and, you know, how they work and why you would use one for one situation and, and why you might choose another for a different situation. So it was informative in that respect. So finish that. It's like May of 1973. So are you, are you, well, I'm not doing the math quickly, but here yeah, you are. I'm 19. 19? Yeah, okay. I'm, I've, just, I've just turned 19. And, uh, or I'm about to turn 19. May of 73. I was born in June of, seven, of 54. If that so you get out of school. Right. So get I get out, out of school. school and, and I decided everybody, uh, I'm going to beat everybody to the punch. Because I know in a couple of weeks, everybody's going to do their finals. And I'm going to like go be going against like thousands of kids looking for jobs for the summer. So about two or three weeks before my finals, I go down the city and that gentleman that I told you I was sitting next to when I was at the principal, he had told me about this friend of his that worked at a studio in Manhattan on Fifth Avenue and it was called National Recording Studio. And National Recording Studio at the time was uh, famous for doing commercials like uh, Ford, Wrigley Spearman Gum, all when you'd watch TV and you and, and the music and the voiceover would be on there. A lot of people don't even think, oh, I guess you would need a studio to do that. And that's was what they did. And so I started there as a tape messenger. Even though I had gone to that school, he said to me, Well, do you know how to edit tape? And I said, Well, I've seen it done, but I have never done it myself. He goes, Okay. 
Well, the best I can do is give you a job as a messenger. Took it. $80 a week, take home 65 Wow. So, and that's for 40 hours. this is hours. in New York City. New York City, walking from eight in the morning until six at night, delivering packages all over Manhattan. So this, this is why you're in such good shape now, oh, right? Oh, I, I don't know about now, but back then, you know, I was probably 150 pounds <laughs> and walking probably 10 miles a day or something, you know. But every place, and, and I'm telling you this story for a reason, and it's not just going through history, it's because uh, I really want your listeners to kind of get a grasp of where where one has to start. Because with all the schools now, a lot of guys that are going to these schools think that they're going to walk out of school and they're going to sit behind the board and be working with Jack White on his next record. And and it's just not going to happen. And it never has happened that way. Every place that I would go when I would deliver these packages, I would fill out an employment form. You know, I'll clean toilets for you. I'll I'll do whatever. Hey, guys, nice to meet you. I hate this job, but do you have a better one for me? (laughs) Exactly. Do you have one that pays me $90 a week instead of $80, you know? As luck would have it, just persistence and luck. And I have to say 50% of being successful in the music business, and especially as an engineer, is luck. It's, it's being at the right place at the right time or some musician that you've worked with in the past that just happens to say to another musician, hey, you got to work with this guy. He's, he's really good. I think you like him. And then all of a sudden it happens. It's, you know, getting those uh, relationships together. It's also putting yourself in a lot of places a lot of the time. It, exactly. Exactly. So I'm telling this story, as I said, because I want your listeners to realize that you just don't walk out of school and immediately walk into an amazing job. So I walked into this studio called Dick Charles. It's May of 73. And the guy says to me, the manager says to me, he says, you work for National, don't you? And I said, yeah, obviously the messenger. And he said, well, National just took my engineer. So now I'm going to take one of their guys. So can you imagine the timing on that? It's like, just happened to be that day that National called up and talked to this studio's engineer and and said to him, would you like to come work for us? And it pissed off the manager so much that just because I walked in and I worked for National, he was like, I'm taking one of their guys. It was like, well, I don't know how to do anything. Uh, He goes, don't worry about it. I'll teach you. So I started there, was doing tape copies. Back then it was quarter inch analog seven and a half IPS. Sometimes, yeah. There you go, right and in, sometimes right, right you would do quarter track. Now, quarter track, for your listeners, is, is, is quarter inch tape. But on a quarter track, you record in one direction. When you ran out of tape, you could flip the tape over and record in the other direction. Yeah, like a so cassette tape, right? it, Like a cassette. You had two stereo. So it's actually got four tracks on it. Exactly. So I was doing tape copies because back in those days, it was just obviously long before CDs. If you were an artist... You would go into a demo studio, which is what this place was, and you would record onto, sometimes, most of the time, it would be just record straight into stereo, quarter inch, 15 IPS. That was the format. And then I would make tape copies for you, and then I would cut a lacquer which is mastering Mm -hmm. slash disc cutting. Mm -hmm. But lacquers in those days were not to be used for manufacturing purposes. They were just used to take your record because every A&R guy in every recording label had a record player. They didn't necessarily have a tape player. You wish they had a tape player, but they all had record players. And that was the medium that they would play your music on. Yeah, this is how you take your, your mix home. Right. So I would cut lacquers of the of a song or a couple of songs for artists, and I would make tape copies. They would take those tape copies and lacquers around to different, you know, to RCA and Sony. Uh, not Sony, what didn't exist. It was CBS. Why didn't you just email them an MP3? Yeah. I mean, didn't, can they just play that on their iPhone? <laughs> it was hitting the pavement and walking around and trying to make appointments with A&R guys and sitting down and they would put your record on and then give you the thumbs up or the thumbs down. And then you'd walk out of there and go to the next place. What an awesome story. And I love the fact that you had this opportunity that put you physically in every studio in town. So you probably knew all these places and knew what was going on. I did. Yeah. The network, the power of networking. You know, I didn't even realize that at the time. I was really... At that age, you know, 19 years old, I was very overwhelmed with everything about it. 
just to walk into Electric Lady or walk into Columbia or Epic or any of these places that had professional studios and you'd see the walls lined with just album after album after album of everything that you grew up on and loved, you know, it was overwhelming and and it just, it was, I hate to use the word awesome, but it was. So I went from there to Record Plant in April 4th, 1974. Wow. Amazing. I want to hear more about Record Plant, but to launch us off, can you give us kind of an inspirational quote, something we can uh, um, get, I've, get I've, inspired to make records right I've now? I've thought about that. And, and the quotes that I'd want to leave your audience with is to, one, is to believe in yourself. You really do have to believe that you can make a difference. And that you've gone to one of these recording schools and you've studied to the best of your ability and learned how your studio etiquette, which is incredibly important, you know, what to say, when to say it, and what not to say in a, in a studio situation. But you have to believe in yourself and believe that you can make a difference. So that's, that's one quote. The other one I want to say is to be patient. Things don't happen right away. And just because they don't happen right away doesn't mean that they're not going to happen. Nice. So that's another one. And the last one is to do your homework. And by that, I mean, when it comes time for you to get an opportunity to work with a band, if they've never done an album before, you should try and go to a live show and see what the band's all about. And then that will give you a really good foundation for what you can capture in the studio. You know, what they're able to pull off in a live show and what they're not able to pull off in a live show. Like you can't always go in the studio and say, oh, well, let's double that guitar and let's double this and let's double that or, you know, and start layering stuff. Because if you make your record in the studio, you can do that in the studio with ease, but then the band goes out there live and there's one guitar. It's not going to sound the same. So to some degree, you have to kind of be able to keep in mind of what the band's able to pull off live so that when they go and perform the record that you're recording live, that they're not a disappointment. Yeah. And that sounds like a little bit of a long tail strategy too. One that says, I'm not just making this one record with you guys today. I'm sort of investing in in you guys and the chance for us to make many more records. That would always that would always be a nice. Certainly, you should think that. From personal experience, I can tell you that it's been a very rare occasion. Even when I've had records that sold millions of copies for a certain band, it didn't mean that the next record I was the first guy called. That's true, and you know that's a good that's a good topic to talk about for just a sec. Yeah, I've noticed that too, mm. and I think at first. I felt a real sense of, you know, bruise to the ego somehow about that. It and then later be, yeah. I started thinking about it. I was like, you know what? The music world and, you know, a scene like Nashville, for example, yeah. bands, there are a lot of places and a lot of people for them to record with. It's kind of like a dating scene where people don't get married, you know? It, uh, you know, I it's guess. like, yeah, it's like you make a record. <laughs> and it's like, it makes sense that the band, you know, they're trying to have an evolving career and, and offer new perspectives with each record. And so it kind of makes sense. I think the good news is that that means that the band that so-and-so across town worked with on the last record, they may be calling you for the next record too. That's that's a good way to look at it. For me, I, I totally relate to the bruised ego. And I say that only because when I go in to make a record, I go in 150%. You know, I don't go in to making of any record unprepared. You know, I get a really good night's sleep. I've listened to what the band has done previous. If they've had a career, and this is what I mean by the homework part, I've listened to their previous records to get an idea of, of where they started and where they might be at the record before the one I'm about to do so that I can take them to what is logically the next step. And I have an idea of what the fan base is used to so that I know when we're making this new record, I am aware of what the fan base is all about. So that's really important. And as I said, that's that's part of the homework thing is to walk into every situation totally prepared. I always try and have a phone call not an email and not a message, but a phone call. And sometimes I'll go out for dinner with the producer a couple of days in advance. You know, sometimes I've produced myself as well as engineer. In that case, I take myself out to dinner and just look in the mirror and, and ask myself what I want to do. <laughs> but uh, in most situations, I'd be working with a producer and I'd say, you know, tell me what it is you're looking for. What kind of sounds 
are you do you have in mind so that when I go in there, I know is it a dead drum sound you're going for? Is it a really live drum sound you're going for? Is it a combination? Are we going to work it song by song? Or, you know, just go over what the producer's concepts are for the band so that you walk in there prepared. Because as an engineer, you are not only responsible to the band to make them happy, you're responsible to the producer to make him happy, and you're responsible to the person who's paying for it, whether it's a label or a management company, you're responsible to them as well to make them happy because they're the one putting out the money. So. Yeah, that's great advice. It's good that you mentioned the importance of knowing who it is that's actually paying for yeah. the recording session yeah. and that you carefully... Yeah. navigate, you know, yeah. the delivery I mean, it's hard the, to keep everybody happy. It really is. Because sometimes you'll be in a situation where the producer and the band are at odds. You know, the producer is is saying, I really want to go in this direction. And the band's saying, well, we totally disagree. We want to go in that direction. I mean, I've got stories that I won't go into, but I've been in that situation. And you feel like you're getting pulled in two directions because the band's feeling like, well, you're supposed to listen to us, man. And the producer goes, you're supposed to listen to me, man. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, uh, uh, And as know. the engineer, you might be, you know, the producer might be the older person in the room and you most might be younger like, of, and more, more similar age to the band. Right. And they're like, come on, you're you're one of us. Come on, dude. Exactly, exactly. I've had some very famous bands I've worked with that have been in disagreement with the producer. And at the end of the session, when the producer goes home, they'll say, hey, listen, we want you to remix this for us. (laughs) And I'm like, all right, well, you know, I'm going to have to check with the management company, make sure this is okay to do. You know, because yeah, you word that one carefully. Thank you so much for the offer. You have guys. to be very, very careful. It's it's treading on eggshells sometimes. But anyway. Yeah, totally. All right. Well, thank Next. you for that's great <laughs> advice about being prepared for a session. Right. Let's humanize it some more and let's talk about share it with us a story where it was a really important failure for you. Something where you where you really did not feel prepared, perhaps, uh, but became a great learning experience. I have a a good one to answer that with. It wasn't a situation where I wasn't prepared, honestly. I'm a very trusting individual, and I was working with a very famous artist, and I was producing and engineering on the record, and I did not know that the lawyer that I had hired was also the artist's lawyer. Now, I'm sure that's against the law, but, you know... Yeah, I think that's conflict of interest, ex- but exact- maybe not in the 1970s. Exactly, right? And, and, and the thing was, it was never divulged to me. So I didn't even know about it until I was going like, wait a minute, this, your attorney is blank, and that's my attorney, you know? Long story short, I trusted that this artist would just do the right thing. You know, we had an agreement on what the point structure was going to be and all that. And then all of a sudden the record's done is actually getting airplay and was actually in the top 10 moving towards number one. And I still did not have a signed contract. It took a year in the end, I had to hire an attorney to get an injunction against the royalties so that no royalties could be paid to the artist or to me until the contract got signed. I mean, and I thought, I thought that was just, it was like, and, and tell me, please, why are you doing this? You know, we did a great job recording this record that we got some hits out of this record that you're, uh, you know, you have a top 10 going to number one and song did go number one. And it made me wonder why, you know, why did you have to just try and make me jump this through is, hoops to get... You recorded Jingle Bells? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and I was in... And it was in Santa Claus? In a was war the culprit? with Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> but so to answer your question, it was trusting people. So what I would say to your audience is you want to go in there thinking that you're going to get a fair shake. You, you know, you don't want to go into a recording situation with a band and think that you're going to get ripped off. You know, you don't want to have that attitude. You don't want to kind of go in there and go, listen, I can't trust you guys, so I got to have such and such signed and sealed delivered, you know, because a lot of times you want to start working on a record. And when it comes down to, to the legal logistics stuff, sometimes that takes a little while to iron out. 
And, and that's why I was being so patient with it because we had a record to make. That was my priority. And, you know, it, at the time, I thought my attorney was going to be contacting his attorney and they were going to be doing that. You know, sometimes I'll take months to iron out. But in the meantime, I'm not, I can't wait for the attorneys to iron it out. Little did I know it was, a, as I said, the guy <laughs> was just, ironing out with himself, right, you know. Right. I just went ahead, trusted that everything would work out right and you know from the beginning and it didn't so that was a learning situation yeah well so what's the takeaway from that the takeaway the the, the takeaway from that is ever when that happened to me it made me aware that i have to be a little bit more savvy in contracts if it's a situation where i'm just going in and engineering i'm getting paid an hourly rate or i'm getting paid a, a daily rate or whatever the deal is then it's not a problem because you're not dealing with a long-term royalty situation. But if you're dealing with, and I, you know, now with records, the biz, the way the business is gone, I don't even know how people do royalties anymore, you know, yeah, because yeah. there's no way to really account for sales. You know, so much stuff is shared that, you know, back in, in my time, it was not uncommon to be part of a record that sold two or three or four or five million copies. And if you were a royalty participant and you sold five million copies, you definitely wanted to know, do I have two points on this or do I have three points or do I have four points? Because within a year's time, when the sales for one year are calculated, it's going to be a big difference. Yeah, you could be talking about millions. You'd be talking about, well, no, right? hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. Yeah, yeah still, not millions, but it might even be tens of thousands. But the nice thing was that after a year or two and working your ass off and the record goes number one, to get a check in the mail the, for fifty or $60,000 was... Finally like, take it, that it, vacation. I call it mailbox money, you know? Yeah, it was right, like, because right. there was no way of knowing... When you were doing it, there was no way to know that this record was going to sell like it did. And the reason that records would sell like that was really all the ducks had to be in a row. You not only had to have a great sounding record with great songs and a great performance of those songs, but you also had to have a record company that backed up that record because there were a lot of records released that were great records but they didn't get the backup from the A&R department and the marketing department and the all the different divisions of a major label. They could make your record sink or swim. Wow. You know, so. Do you see similarities for releases of music now, today, records, singles? I mean, do you, do you find that you need to have all the right things lined up? I don't up? think so. it's really the, the consumer is the winner nowadays you know for as for an artist or the people that are in the position of making the record because you have iTunes now and iTunes takes a fairly decent percentage of the sale of your single and i don't even know how some of the other means like you know you got Spotify and you've got Pandora i mean you know you're paid pennies to my knowledge on the amount of records downloaded but well, you, you so still I see records as having success stories today though i think there are more one hit wonders these days there's a lot of bands that i listen to on some of these streaming uh, mediums that i think man that is a really really great song and I'll check out the record and I'll find several songs that uh, that I like a lot. And I would normally become a fan of this band, but then a year goes by and they're gone. Mm. And I find that more often these days. Is, I guess it's a combination of uh, being able to go in and do a record way, way less expensive than it used to cost. So, you know, the bar is kind of uh, yeah, been used to way be, lowered. Now you have to make a record on what used to be the catering budget. Yeah. Right. Pretty much. <laughs> uh, it, yeah. It, catering budgets were sometimes healthier than what you're given these days to make a record. And a lot of bands are actually making records and funding them through their live shows. And so, um, you know, you're talking about now sometimes a few thousand dollars to make an entire album 
which is really, really yeah, hard totally, to do. Yeah, totally, with a lot of uh, independent bands, too. So yeah. maybe now the things that need to be in sync have more to do with the band's overall business strategies. Like, how do I we would make say, a record? How do we play shows? How do exactly. we pay for things? Yeah. And then, like, longevity of doing that is a measure of success itself. Exactly. You know, yeah, very a, well put. You can have a healthy lifestyle with it. Yeah. You know, nothing lasts forever. Even when I would work with young bands over the past 10, 15 years, when I'd work with young bands that were working on the first record, when we were in those moments of just hanging out and having a beer or whatever, I would say to them, now listen, you know, your career, it, it might last 20 years and it might last two years. So be very wise with whatever income you're able to make from the success of, or, you know, of this record, should it be successful. Don't go out and buy the Ferrari uh, or, you know, don't waste it because um, it might, you, you know, and if it lasts 10 years, be really, really grateful. Yeah, you may need something else other than a, yeah. a Ferrari. You might yeah. need rent money down the road. Yeah. Well, so let's jump to a, a moment of success for you, something where everything seemed to come together really nicely for you in, in uh, recording. I've, I've been really fortunate to have a couple. One was one band that I was able to share some success with in the very beginning when I was I started working with the Jay Giles band from Boston. They Great records, thanks. They we started working together in 75. I worked with Bill Simzik, who's known for the Eagles, known for Hotel California. There you go. He worked on my very console right there. That's right. And genius producer and engineer, just have the most respect for him than anybody could. As luck would have it, when the next record was coming about, Bill was in the studio with the Eagles doing Hotel California. And <laughs> let me just give another shout out. <laughs> yeah, my another console. shout out to the console. Yeah, it was the one. Those are the faders he was pushing uh, around. It, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable that they did it on a console. Was that, is that 30 faders or? Uh, 24 mix <laughs> faders. And then I think we have 20 mic pre's on it. It's a split yeah. section. It's, I use it's, the mic pre's all the time. Yeah. And I use the mixing side, you know, for special, special occasions. Yeah. It, it's, it's awesome that the, the history of that console, because Bill couldn't make it. And I was working at the record plant at the time. Roy Sakala, who had worked with John Lennon on his Imagine album, and had also worked on the Walls and Bridges album. He was kind of John's engineer when John left the Beatles. And so Jay Giles basically asked Roy to do the record, this this up and coming record, the, this next release after Bill's record. And so Roy booked me as the assistant on it because he knew that I knew the band. We had a, a good rapport. So the very first day of that record, I set everything up. The band was out there rehearsing. They had their headsets going. Everything was balanced. Everything was going to tape, levels. I had EQ'd everything. And I was happy. I had to make myself happy, but I knew that he'd be pretty happy with how it sounded. And so I went into the office and I said, Roy, everything's ready. The band's all set, you know, tapes on the machine. It's ready to go. You just have to walk in and I have to record. So he came walking in, sits down. He stayed for the first minute of the first take of the first song of this to be album. And he swings his chair and I'm standing at the multi-track. I'm standing next to the machine. Roy turns to me and he says, I'll be in my office. If you need me, call me. If you don't need me, don't call me. So I'm like... I'm like, he's pulling my leg. There's no way that he's walking down in this session, right? Wow. So I'm standing by the machine. The first take ends. We were in a, in a control room at Record Plant Studio C. The control room was a little bit higher than the studio physically. So when you were standing as a musician on the floor in the studio, you couldn't really see if someone was behind the console or not. Because the console came up so high in the front uh -huh. that, you know, unless you stood up. And those steep 70s consoles with the, with the yeah, like, where the like meters you're looking came, up at TV screens yeah, or something in front of you. Yeah, them. and so, you know, the band didn't know that he left. So the first take ends, and the the guys out in the room. And this is Jay Giles. This band. Jay Giles, right. Peter Wolf, the whole you know. Old, they go. So how was that? They were ex obviously expecting Roy to get on talkback. So I walk over from the tape machine to the talkback, and I said, "That was really good." <laughs> but why don't we try two or three more, and then come in and listen? And I, I think they were kind of wondering why I was answering, but you know, they were like, "Okay." 
Well, now they're all, they're digging in. Then they're like, okay, well, we played our first take. Now we're going to start playing seriously, right? So they start the second take and already the levels that I had obtained for the first take, everything's starting to move closer into the red, yeah, right? Yeah, totally, totally. So I'm like, well, he's not back. I better, I can't just let this go. You know, I, the, everything's going to be slammed, you know? I mean, I'm into like tape compression, but this would have been absurd. So I walked over and I'm, I'm like, pulling everything gently back. I think I stopped them after about 30 seconds. So do you do you like to make the adjustment during the take or do you decide well, this is not going to be a take, they, so I'm going to make adjustments? They started the second take. As they started it, about 30 seconds in, I had everything and I just kind of hit the tarp back and blah, 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 blah. And let's try that one more time because I, I had to make some adjustments. Okay, I didn't okay. want to, I didn't want a great performance to be, right, you know, totally, and totally. I didn't want to change levels in the middle of a performance. Yeah, you know, you God forbid if that's the one, you know? Right, right. So that's how I, I, and you can't, I, you can't really make the adjustments unless they're playing to make the adjustments Exactly. Too. Exactly. Yeah. Because I, I need to see how hard they're playing to make the adjustments. You can't yeah. just arbitrarily pull the faders down because you might go too you far. You could try. You could try, but <laughs> much smarter to do it while they're playing, you know? So I did that and, and it was really quick. I mean, we were only recording probably maybe 15 tracks of, or less. I used to use four tracks for drums. It was kick, snare, stereo, drums. Nice. And and that was that and was. Would you would you mix your overheads and uh, your tom mics? My together overheads, my toms, my hi hat, any, any yeah. So it was just kick, snare, and then the whole kit. And so it was really kind of easy, you know. So I had bass, you know, drums. I could just kind of grab probably ten faders worth of drums with my ten fingers and just pull them back. Keyboards, guitar, and Peter's vocal, and then went up, up, up. Okay, let's start over again. And they did. They did their extra two or three takes and they came walking in. Now I'm like I'm maybe 21 at this point in time. So I, and, and sometimes. Still young and cherubim looking <laughs> in the studio there, right? Sometimes people would say, would say to me when I'd be assisting around that same time period on sessions, they'd say, you old enough to be in the studio. You, you look like 10th grade or something, you know? And on some old photos of me, you'll see I started growing a mustache because I thought, well, this will make me look a little bit older. <laughs> so they came walking in. They go, where's Roy? And I said, he's in his office. You know, he said that if we need him to call him and if we don't need him not to call him. And they were like, ah, eh, we don't need him. So they're like, let's listen back to those four takes. And that was it. I'm going to go really quickly now. It was just a, a very interesting story to tell. No, it's great. Hey everybody, it's Lid Shaw, and I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode of Recording Studio Rockstars. I really appreciate you, and I really appreciate your time. And as a way of saying thank you, I've created a special mix tutorial just for you, Rockstars, totally free, called the Mix Master Bundle. With it, you get over two hours of detailed videos watching over my shoulder as I mix a song in my studio. Plus, I give you the free ebook that explains how I recorded the tracks, and you get downloadable multi tracks so that you can practice your mixes, including the Pro Tools session file, using nothing but stock plugins in Pro Tools, all of which you would find in any other DAW, whether you're on Logic or Studio One or Reaper. Maybe you're struggling with trying to improve your mix technique, or maybe you just simply don't have access to multi track files or can't record a full drum set in your studio. I wanted to give you a chance to create your own mixes from full drum kit, bass, and guitar is recorded in my studio. The song is called American Winter, and it's off my instrumental record, Skadoosh, and it's all available for you totally free right now. All you need to do to get it is text Mix Master Bundle to 33444, and I'll send it directly to your email. Again, that's Mix Master Bundle with no space to 33444, or you can go directly to mixmasterbundle.com Enter your email, and I'll send all the files directly to you. Thanks so much, rock stars. We'll see you guys in the jam session. Cheers. All right, it's time for us to start geeking out. Um, okay. I, the rock stars are gonna they're gonna send me hate mail if I don't yes, start getting into some, I, I've, I've, some gear I've talk way, and way. studio stuff and all that too. You know, one of the things I noticed when I was listening to the Jay Giles band and, and going and listening to your discography again, it reminded me of how much that sound that you guys did was really definitive for the 80s and even. And I don't want to jump forward because I feel like you were making yeah. definitive sounds for the, the 70s too. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
And it also reminded me of, of like Huey Lewis band and stuff. It's sort of like- Huey you know, Lewis probably, came after us. Right, I mean, exactly, you know, yeah. so, and in fact, when Huey Lewis came out, Do You Believe in Love? Right. Do you? I, that was one of his first songs. Yeah. And I was in England with Mutt Lang sitting at the console when Mutt wrote that song. Mutt wrote, Do You Believe in Love? Wow. Right? And Huey got the demo of it. And while I was in the control room mixing ACTC, <laughs> the call came in from Huey to discuss with Mutt how Mutt wanted that song approached. Wow. So, wow. If, you know, it all kind of is this weird connecting thing. And here I had just finished Jay Giles and and Mutt had actually, when I, I had a cassette of a of, of freeze frame when it was finished and I was literally finished freeze frame and like three days later went to Paris to start recording um, for those about to rock. And I... Mud had said to me, oh, one of the re reasons he was hiring me was because he loved Love Stinks. That was one of his favorite records nice. the previous year. And so I decided I'll bring him a cassette of the new record, gave it to him in Paris, because that's where we we're recording. And I said, here's the new Giles album. Tell me what you think. And he came back to me the next morning. He goes, I don't think there's a hit on there. Really? So, Yeah. In the meantime, we had freeze frame. We had, um, uh, I don't know, we had like- Centerfold. Three, centerfold. Right? Yeah, we had like three three major number yeah, ones. The album sold like 4 million records. And, and he wasn't feeling it at he the time? He was not feeling it at all. So yeah. All right, well, so this is it's a great way for you to spin it back to some of these sure. questions I want to ask. Sure. So the, the Jay Giles sound, um, this this sort of introduction, like we're launching the 80s, you know, right. in, in somewhere in the back of my head, I've, I'm picturing, you know, Back to the Future is about to get released and mm -hmm. all that kind right, of stuff. Right, right. It seemed like there were more effects happening in those records. You know, too. I, I have to credit to a large degree, major degree, Seth Justman, the keyboard player. He was the producer he took over the production reins on a lot of those records. And Seth was into interesting sounds. And, and he had this new keyboard that had a pitch bend on it. It was one of the first ones. And I don't remember what the model number was, but it had a pitch bend on it. Specifically, when you brought up no anchovies, I think there's a moment where it goes... <laughs> Yeah, probably, right? Right, right. And that was just him holding down a chord and taking the pitch bend and just, it was controlled with like a felt thing. Right, right. Yeah, the sliders, yeah, the like slide, the Moog keyboards. Exactly. Yeah. So Seth, I have to give him 100% of the credit for that. Jay was also very, very into memory mans and stomp boxes. I was trying to keep up with everybody, you know. Yeah. I, and, and tight effects too, things that are kind of quick. Yes, right? yes. We were more into delays than reverbs. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's jump into working with one of the greatest rock bands ever, ACDC. Yeah. Let's talk about drums on that. So the drum sounds on an okay. ACD record are- This is going to be- Are you about to let me down? Are you yes, I'm about to let bubble? you down. I'm about to let you down and let you know that for those about to rock- I was finished with Freeze Frame in like July of, I want to say 1980. And as I said, the, I literally finished on a Friday and I got, a got on a plane Sunday to be in Paris on Monday. And what had happened is the album had started about three months prior with a different engineer. They got the drum tracks done. It took them about two, about eight to 10 weeks to get the drum tracks. And right. I think I was reading that that record started out in one studio and then moved to a warehouse or something. To we, continue that, or something the, the drums were cut at the Rolling Stones rehearsal. It was like a big, huge stone cavern, right? And, nice. and it was in Paris. It was out, outside of Paris, about 20 minutes ride outside of Paris. And we used Mobile One out of London as mm -hmm. the record truck because it was just a big, empty stone room. Mutt and and uh, the engineer had pulled Mobile One up to the building, and all the lines, the mic lines, were running from the truck into this huge stone room. So the drums were recorded by Mark Durnley. He is credited 
or, or should be if he isn't. I believe he is. He ran out of time. He, uh, I guess he had to do another record, had a commitment to another producer. Mutt called me up and said, hey, you know, I've been down here with Mark, but he's been run- he's running out of time. Can you come to Paris and, and finish this record? So I came in at guitar times. He asked me guitars, vocals. I basically finished uh, rhythms, leads, and vocals. Well, you know, even the guitars, I mean, listen to the beginnings. Uh, I'm going to blank on pulling all the names of the songs off, yeah, off the top yeah, of my head. Yeah. So I'll just say that some of the intros, you hear the guitars and you can hear this sort of room splash going on with the guitar mics. Talk a little bit about the recording of the guitars in that. So the deal was to get the most amazing, and, and they weren't into layering. When Malcolm set up, it was the kind of classic thing of taking stage one of the amplifier and plugging it into stage two, you know, right, the right. kind of- little jumper cable. little jumper cable. And we used 87s. So close with yeah, Norman pa- U87. Yep, yeah, right. with with a pad because they were so close they were like almost kissing the cloth. Wow, wow. That's how close they were. And do you would you describe those as having a dark quality to the mics and that's what makes them nice up close? I like think that for for the tone that Mutt was looking for a specific tone and that was the mic that got it for him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I believe it was just two 87s. You know, we went through four speaker cabinet. We kind of went through and found the best two speakers out of those four. Okay, cool. And then mic those mic those two up and then brought those those two up in the in the truck. Interesting. And then you might have had a room mic up in that stone room as well you know, or something like um, that, possibly? We, we might have. And, and then, um, to some degree, it's very possible. The AMS RMX right, the reverb. for the mixing of For Those About to Rock, AMS gave me a prototype awesome. of that unit. Are you going to tell me that's the part of the snare sound, too? On that's the, part, of the, part of the snare sound. The other part of the snare sound was taking... An even tide. Do you remember the the even tide pitch control? Is it, is it, uh, there was a black control. box that even the nine ten or something. I was like something that? like that. The nine ten, and it had a feedback. Do you remember that? I think so. It had yeah. a little feedback control. So we would take the pitch. We would take the snare down an octave. Yes. Okay. And then we would put the turn the feedback up. So when the snare would hit, it would go. Brrr. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a side chain, you know. So, so we that's would, blended back that's into the blended snare sound. As a, you know, that, that deepness. That, that's, that was, sent, you know, from ascend and then bringing it back or parallel to the snare and just bringing it in to add a little bit of not of this earth snare sound. Wow. <laughs> that gave it a lot of depth. I mean, the snare was like a black beauty in the first place. So then that going, you know, pitching it down an octave and then doing that whole little trick and bringing it up, that made it even a little bit more insane. Awesome. So what you're saying is that all those times when we are recording and mixing our snares and we are just, our gut is telling us, why do we not ro- rock enough? It's because we need that. We need that extra. Well, it's a trick because that record was done on twenty-four track. It was very straight ahead, you know. On that record, Mud was not a believer in layering for for ACDC. It was very much organic and not layering. So it would just get really great sounds out of each instrument that's going to be playing. That's so cool. You know? So and the drums on that, like the kick, is just massive. You know, it's yeah. like. It really, the low end just, it's pillowy Mark, and Mark, huge. Mark Durnley just did a great job. I'll have to give him credit. And you were mixing the drums, right? So we can talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mixed, I mixed the whole record. Yeah, right. I mean, so, yeah. so one of the things about the snare is that it explodes when it hits. It's like, it's 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 breaking just a little bit. Can you talk about that, about arriving at a, a sound that sounds like it's explode the exploding snare sound? You know, you know it, it's really interesting. If if your interpretation of it is that it that's that's great, it wasn't something I was doing intentionally. We finished recording. We got on a plane with all the multi track masters, and we flew to London, and we immediately went to Battery to make sure um, everything was arrived okay, and that the we had to pass the master tapes through. Uh, security. Right, so right. we X-ray were we were a little something. concerned yeah. that, but we we actually tried not to when we went to the the police at the at the Paris airport and said to them, "Listen, these are multi-track. We had them wrapped in I think aluminum foil to try and protect them, um, which was a 
a thing back in those days. It was like, okay, if you wrap them right, in... I, it, I saw it, Spinal Tap. I know about the, wrapping stuff <laughs> in aluminum foil. <laughs> so so we, we did that, and um, we went into literally the police station that was inside the airport, and we said to the head chief guy, we said, we cannot pass these through. These are master multi-tracks. We didn't have safeties. Wow. We, we didn't have the time. It would have taken so long to make safeties. And we would just, we literally finished recording at whatever, two in the morning, and we were on like the eight o'clock flight. Yeah. So it would have taken like another day or two to make safety. So we just packed up the masters. I want to say been there, done got, that, but and, I don't feel like I can really say that. I've never done that. <laughs> never done that in my life. And I'm sure Mutt's never done it in his life uh, ever since that, you know, because we were both a little concerned that. You know, we had master, uh, master ACDCs, yeah, ACDC happen. masters, and that you know. And you don't get so, to hold them in your arms on the plane, do you? Or did yeah, you? We did. You did. You just hold. Them. Oh yeah, we held them. Bear yeah. hug all the way. All the way, and and landed in Heathrow, and went immediately to. You said battery. Was battery. Right. Yep. Yeah. Put them up. Everything was fine. So we were both were like, sigh of relief yeah. <laughs> when we listened, and everything was fine. But getting back to what you were saying, you know, I'm in in. Battery studios, I've never been in a studio ever in my life. And I'm on, I don't know what they had, might have had Altex or something like that, but I really tried the best I could to take stuff I was familiar with, which is my rule of thumb when I'm in a studio I don't know, and kind of listen back and try the best I can to get used to the monitors. At that period of time and, and just the acoustics of the room and all that, it was really, really hard getting used to that room. Our console was maybe just a little bit further back than your console is here, and they were flush mounted. They were they were in, soffits. They were the soffit walls, yeah. mount yeah, they were right there. So it was really hard for me. At Record Plant we had Westlakes and and you were back uh, I wanna say um, 20, 30 feet. Wow. Yeah. You know, so you're trying to get your bearings. You're trying to absolutely find your balance of confidence. You know, to here start I making am in decisions. a studio where I'm. You know, my, the the big monitors are about maybe twelve feet. <laughs> so, wow. and so I did, as I said, what I usually do, which is to listen back to stuff that I'm familiar with. But it was really, really difficult. And, and so, so are you looking, are you dealing with four tracks of drums as you go in to mix this record? No, no, I don't think Mark, that, I think that was Mark's practice. I don't remember exactly, but I want to say that Mark was probably into an inside, outside on the kick, uh, probably a top and bottom on the snare. Uh, toms recorded separately. Uh, he might've had mixed toms. My, as I said, my early format was four track, but that it was because we only had 16 tracks of to record on. Once we got 24, we'd break it out a little bit. So you'd do kick, snare, stereo toms, and then stereo cymbals and hi-hat so yeah. that you could ride your toms up and or do, you know. Right, so yeah, you, might, more, uh, you might sort flexibility. of create a sound for a tom fill that sounds cool, and then you just scoot it out of the way when there's not a fill happening, ex ex highlight exactly. it when the fill comes along. Exactly. Well, I would find a spot on the faders where the tom tracks, I'd get that leakage of the kick and the snare, the natural leakage you would get into your tom mics. And that and sort of gives your, your drums a little bit of a stereo ex quality, right? Stereo quality, a little bit of air. I like to kind of call yeah, it. Yeah. And I would bring them up to the point where the leakage worked with the kick and the snare. It didn't dilute the kick and the snare. It didn't dilute the attack of the kick and the snare, but it didn't make the kick and snare sound um, sterile. Right, or you know, boxy. It or sounded very kind of, natural. Yeah. And then mark it, because we're talking about manual mixing. And then I'd mark the fader with a piece of tape and a little you know, pen or whatever. And then every time a tom fill would come up, I had to memorize the tom fills. But I'd find a spot where I want them to go, and then it became manual mixing. Well, you you're know. saying as a mixer, you had to be musical? Yeah, you had to <laughs> use a console like you would a keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> like you would a performance, right? A performance, yeah. Well, that's really interesting, too, because I know now in this world of Pro Tools and, and DAWs, it's so easy to make it an automatic step to say, I'll just go and clean up the Tom tracks before I mix, yeah. you know? And then yeah. but what you're doing is you're removing a lot that, of the that character. sympathetic ring of the yes. Toms in there. Exactly. So it's very cool to think of, don't try and find that one place where the Toms live, find right. that place where they live for the most of the time and you just have to ride them up for every Tom fill. Exactly. So I'll be exactly. doing that on my next record. Yeah, you know, that might've been one of the first SSLs also that we were working on. Interesting. It was, it was, Mutt had, I think he might've had the second or third SSL built 
by SSL in Oxford. We neither of us were familiar with having lows, low mids, upper mids. I actually asked Mutt to bring in like twenty four tracks of Poltex. And we wow, did. we did. Wow, because some of the EQ was actually back in the day when the SSL first came out. It, it was obviously the E, the E EQ, and it, in the when they first came out, it was kind of harsh. Right. You know, even though you'd mess with the Q, obviously, you know, when you as soon as you broke off the detent, it was like instantly two or three dB. And sometimes... Oh, a big a boost. It would it really was, change. Yeah, it was... As soon as you'd crack off that detent, no matter what frequency you were at, it was serious. Yeah. You yeah. know? And so sometimes we were looking for a little bit of EQ, you know? Like, can I have a, a you know, a dB at 10K, not like 3 dB at 10K? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I think uh, we brought in, maybe not 24, maybe 20, but we brought in a shitload of Poltex. And yeah. I remember a lot of times running into the Poltex free EQ because I wasn't, I wasn't as comfortable. Sometimes I'd use the SSL, you know, when it was something that was uh, maybe like a guitar thing where I wanted a certain kind of mid range. Right, right. Then I wanted a really aggressive sound. But sometimes I wanted more a subtle sound. Yeah, maybe that maybe that pillowy, that big soft maybe kick some drum of that bottom maybe end some of that is that, is yeah. the fact that it's going through Poltex. And even the explosion on the snare that I hear that that crack and Yeah, snap, maybe you know, that's it's it's it a Poltex tubes and stuff. Yeah, too, tubes and transformers. And I, so I want to say that on that particular record, I probably used the automation. So it was one of the first times. Um, it wasn't the first time. It was the first time I used SSL automation. On the Jay Giles stuff, we actually had automation where it was a computer. It it would put like a SMPTE code thing on track one, and it would feed your faders. And, and your faders could move and around. Your fader and your faders could move up and down. And you would take the output of that move and put it to track 24. And then when you want to do more moves, you'd play back 24 and make the change and it'd go get recorded back on track one. It was that wow. p- that primitive. That's hard work. Yeah, it was a lot of... That's what allowed you to start having that control of yes. everything. And that's probably part of that, you know, 80s sound is just starting to control a lot of a lot of things in a yeah. mix, maybe. And when I first started using automation, because it was so primitive, I would a lot of times try and do a performance as my first pass. Like I would try and get three quarters of the mix try and get all the drum fills if I could, try and get the solo if I could. And then on my second pass, I'd go through and get all the vocal rides. And so I would try and limit down to maybe three or four passes. And, but the good thing was I could play it back each time and kind of listen to it with all the rides being made. And was that was incredible. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.